The entire Bloodline storyline and the elevation of Roman Reigns to the top of the industry owes a lot to Luck, Chance and Sami Zayn. Audibles were called constantly. Plans were changed from the very first second and the guy writing it changed twice in the middle of it. This should not have worked. So why did it? I'm going to break down the mistakes, the missteps and the secrets that made the Bloodline a success. Gather around the campfire and leave your likes, let's get started. We start way back at the beginning of 2020, when nothing bad was happening in the world at all. Roman Reigns was planned to be going into a WrestleMania match against Goldberg, where he would win the Universal Championship. This is not something that actually ended up happening because of the global pandemic that shut down the WWE entirely. The WWE instead had to present a show out of their performance center, making a WrestleMania that nobody has ever watched since, and let's be honest, no one's ever going to watch again. For those unaware, Roman Reigns is a man living with leukemia. He is immunocompromised. He is a little more fragile than many of us, and he needs a little bit of additional protection. During a global pandemic, there was no possibility that he would be able to risk any chance of contracting that disease. He had to step away and he was essentially forcibly retired. For the WWE's part, they made sure Roman Reigns vanished off the face of the earth. He wasn't mentioned in high packages for anything else. The Shield was Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins, even though Dean Ambrose left as well. And it did mean that there were no creative plans being made for Roman Reigns. Roman Reigns was separated entirely. The WWE had nothing, they chose to keep nothing, and Braun Strowman was parachuted in to defeat Goldberg, win the Universal Championship, and go on to feud with The Fiend Bray Wyatt. During this time between WrestleMania and SummerSlam, and largely down to the impact of a Sami Zayn and a Kevin Owens, those names are gonna come up a lot, the WWE took action to ensure the safety of their wrestlers. Protections were put in place for immunocompromised wrestlers, no more so than Roman Reigns, but there were also protections put in place for Bray Wyatt, and that's why a lot of his work was filmed afterwards, was recorded and then reshot, and a lot of his work happened when there was no one in the arena other than a very select group of people. This is a blueprint that was later used for Roman Reigns. The end result of this was the Thunderdome. The cinematic era lasted about four months and then it was gone. We had a swamp fight. We had a fight at the top of Titan Tower. You look back and you wonder how any of this actually happened, but it did. I promise you it did. It wasn't a fever dream. Those things really happened. Instead, we had the Thunderdome designed to protect Roman Reigns and that allowed Roman Reigns to return. As the Thunderdome was being built, a conversation between Paul Heyman and Vince McMahon would change who Roman Reigns was. Conversations had been taking place between Heyman and Roman Reigns for years about the final version of what Roman Reigns should be, how he could get the fans on his side or abandon them entirely. Paul Heyman pitched a mafia style villain to Vince McMahon and Vince McMahon swallowed it up with gusto. That man was lapping it down for his life. Just like that, Roman Reigns was a heel, something Vince McMahon had essentially promised to never do under any circumstances. Roman would be a heel, Paul Heyman would be the guy making sure, and he needed to be taking on big names in order to establish that. However, that's the first audible, because the opponents that he was originally planned to face would not actually involve the championship. He first got involved in a match between Bray Wyatt and Braun Strowman, people who were not meant to be there at all. And the audibles were immediate. Strowman was a last minute addition anyway. He had not been intended to win a world championship and I do believe he still wouldn't have won a world championship if not for this moment. Instead, this was Roman's introduction. Paul Heyman pitched the Mafia villain and Vince McMahon grabbed it with both hands and probably showed half his staff the pictures. The stage was set for SummerSlam to be step one of a story that would span nearly a decade, which was still only just approaching halfway through, even though, and I'll tell you more on this, they got rid of about eight months of it halfway through what we've already seen. Now as champion and with the demeanor to match, Jey Uso was chosen as Roman's first opponent, primarily because of the family connection, but also because of that element of protection for Roman Reigns. This element of protection is going to come up a lot, and it's the main reason Roman Reigns wasn't a solo act. 
WWE were attempting to ensure that Roman had little to no risk during the pandemic, so he was afforded his own council, his own areas, his own eating arrangements, and he had a hand in selecting those he feuded with. If Roman Reigns felt that you were not being safe enough to safeguard Roman Reigns, you were out the door fast. This is in fact one of the main reasons Roman has wrestled Kevin Owens so often. It's simply because Kevin Owens, as I mentioned previously, was one of the most vocal voices backstage before the Thunderdome demanding better medical security, something which the WWE at the time seemed uninterested in. Roman knew for certain Kevin Owens would not risk contracting the disease and thus passing it on. Roman wrestled very rarely early on, but still had some great matches. The Royal Rumble match with Kevin Owens, outside of the handcuff thing, was fantastic. Comment below your personal favourite. Even the addition of Jey Uso was not originally planned. Initial plans only featured a single match for Jey Uso, which he himself has confirmed, as a way to buy time for further feuds to come into play. A match with Big E was being mentioned at the time, which didn't happen until many years later, as well as a pursuit of Vince McMahon's purported boner for Matt Riddle. You remember that? Yeah. However, Roman had been watching WWE during his time off, and he had found ways to engage with an absentee crowd. Specifically, were citing the match between Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley at that year's WrestleMania, in which Charlotte Flair made as much noise as possible vocally in order to ensure that there was entertainment going in multiple different senses at once. Roman Reigns learned from Charlotte Flair in that moment. He could engage with that absentee crowd. During the match with Jay, Roman showed a new side that connected heavily and given their history, another match was planned based on that. I quit Hell in a Cell, first of its name and only thus far. This match came together quickly and had a lot to do with the unfortunate distrust that Roman generally had for many in the locker room at the time. In many ways, this was justified, as matches with certain wrestlers had to be pushed back on a number of occasions due to breaches of pandemic safety protocols. There were some concerns about certain wrestlers who vocally did not believe that they were at any risk. I'm not going to name any names whatsoever. There were no, for example, champs that ran the camp in that day. Roman's new limited day contract largely allowed for this, but this is also why main event Jey Uso was born. The intention was not to push Jey Uso, the intention was to protect Roman Reigns. Jey Uso became Roman's shield. As regards the inspiration, Paul Heyman was the man behind I Quit Hell in a Cell. He recognised the implications of family and how Jimmy Uso could be used to further an overall storyline. He also recognised that just himself and Roman wouldn't really work. A faction was built to protect Roman, to shield him and also to give him people to play off in backstage segments that could be recorded in batches, protecting Roman from having to spend time in an arena that carried additional risk because of how many people spent time in that ring. Jey Uso was added to the bloodline after the I Quit Hell in a Cell to act as a proxy for Roman, literally fighting his battles so that Roman didn't have to spend a lot of time in the arena. This was followed by the return of Jimmy Uso, whose storyline was intended to last months and instead lasted a handful of weeks. He, like his brother, had been intended to become a forced bloodline member. The idea was that Roman versus Jimmy would happen, and it still kind of hasn't. Unfortunately, trouble with the law and accusations of alcoholism resulted in this part of the bloodline story being scrapped entirely. Jimmy was paired with his brother in order to ensure that he was looked after, in much the same way as Matt and Jeff Hardy are constantly paired together. This didn't just affect the bloodline. This had a direct impact on Naomi, someone who was now inside the Roman Reigns bubble whether she wanted to be or not, and thus had to ensure that everyone she spent time with would not present a risk to Roman Reigns. The bloodline really was formed because of the ongoing pandemic at this time. Overall, the original mafia movie Roman Reigns villain that had been pitched to Vince McMahon ended up nothing like had been intended. The bloodline became the faction with Roman, Paul Heyman and the Usos. This was and still is the OG bloodline. The first batch this was Paul Heyman's doing, pulling the wool over McMahon's eyes in a way that got Roman over big time. 
Once Vin saw the amount of money coming in, he stopped fighting and started writing, taking the reins over from Paul Heyman. The next member of the Bloodline, in fact, was not a Paul Heyman decision, but one that Vince McMahon foisted on him. I can't imagine he's unhappy about that now. Sami Zayn had been WWE's biggest loser for over a year, when, around Royal Rumble time, around the same time that Kevin Owens was being beaten down with a golf buggy, the idea was pitched to have Sami Zayn become a Bloodline member. This would create tension within the Bloodline and push us towards a finale moment between Jey Uso and Roman Reigns once again, something that Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman had been pushing hard for. The introduction of Sami Zayn was always designed to move towards Jey Uso being thrown out of the Bloodline, winning his way back and then defeating Roman Reigns to become Universal Champion. At this point, it feels best to discuss how far away from this year's WrestleMania main event we were when this whole thing started. None of this was planned. Was there a plan for The Rock? Yes. The plan was for Roman Reigns to beat The Rock and be acknowledged whenever was most convenient for The Rock. Was there anything involving Cody Rhodes? Hell no. The man wasn't even in the WWE. So who was going to be the guy? Jey Uso. Even that, though, has an element of revisionist history. What if Bray Wyatt had been fit and healthy? There were plans for Bray Wyatt to be Roman's first major foe, to be the end game feud, but this ended up not being an option. What if Goldberg had been willing to return during the pandemic instead of after? Well, Spear vs Spear would have been back on and not save for Bron Breaker vs Roman Reigns sometime next year. Roman's heel turn might be the only intentional move that the WWE actually made here. Most of this was forced on them. And in the end, it's worked beautifully because of the characters, because of the ad-libbing, because of the acting, because Sami Zayn could break Roman Reigns just by eating popcorn. Because during a match on SmackDown, Roman Reigns looked at Sami Zayn eating popcorn and thought, people are laughing at that, you know what? Get me some popcorn, people will laugh at that too. And I still laugh at that. Was Sami Zayn ever expected to be a world champion? No. I still suspect that's the case. He wasn't even supposed to get the title shot. As I reported the September before that year's WrestleMania, the plan was always to have Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn defeat the Usos for the Tag Team Championships, setting into motion Jay versus Roman as we had that following SummerSlam. It was all, always supposed to be Sami versus Jay, building Jay up ready for it to be Jay versus Roman. Sami Zayn, however, is astounding. The man gets pro wrestling, and he made the whole storyline so much more... Usy. Nobody even knew it wasn't Usy enough until Zayn made it Usy. 40 minutes of Bloodline promo? Yes, please. Honestly, I would have called the audible. F the Bloodline, Sami Zayn is king. Vince, annoyingly, got this one absolutely right. Before we get to Cody Rhodes and the most opportunic WrestleMania in history, we have to touch on what happens next. What happens next is one of those real rare moments in wrestling, a storyline that has been executed exactly as it was planned. It's also by far the least popular part, Solo Sokoa as the Tribal Chief. Not Roman Reigns, not The Rock, Solo Sokoa is your Tribal Chief, yours and mine. We don't get a choice in this. Solo said, I'm the Tribal Chief, people raise the ones, sucks to be you. Your head of the table, your forward line to a brand new, fresh and exciting bloodline is Solo Sokoa. Talents like Tama Tonga and Jacob Fatu have revitalized SmackDown, and Tonga Loa is also there. Seriously, I can confirm, Tonga Loa often happens to be in the same ring as the incredible talent I just mentioned. How many people do you know that would give their right arm for some of this backstage booking carnage now? In the depths of winter, Many moons ago, Triple H walked into Vince McMahon's office and changed the bloodline forever by telling him Cody Rhodes wanted to return. In that instant, Jey Uso vs Roman Reigns became secondary. Triple H would change that plan, meaning that Cody would have to wait another year. In that time, The Rock arrived and insisted on the WrestleMania main event against Roman. Everyone agreed, except Cody. Eventually, 
even Roman Reigns and Paul Heyman broke ranks and said no. Everyone fell in line and as predicted, as planned, but as not originally planned in any way, Cody Rhodes broke the bloodline. The bloodline storyline that was written years in advance was broken by a guy who wasn't even there. The bloodline made Jey Uso a top superstar. It made Roman Reigns the most popular name in wrestling. Step aside CM Punk, step aside Sasha Banks, Roman Reigns was the guy. It convinced the WWE that Sami Zayn was worth everything in the world, something they should have known from day one-ish. In fact, if we ignore the solo Sokoa of it all, and probably ignore most of the Brock Lesnar apart from the digger and the microphone catch, or the microphone catch, we might well have seen a generational faction and a generational storyline. Not only that, we actually knew we were in the good days when we were in them. Sometimes WWE does things just right. The bloodline definitely won. For details on the WWE returns of Becky Lynch, Big E, Jimmy Uso and more, check out the video that's on screen now. And let me know if I fix that pesky echo, I've been trying a few things but I don't really trust it.